So uh, we have a couple of days here. We'll be um, exploring the microbiology of the built environment. As you may have noticed in your uh, handouts and your booklets, we're going to be looking at the, the, where the Moby program came from, where we've gotten to, uh, actively discussing where we're moving from research to applications. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll also be discussing future directions. You'll hear that mentioned a number of times throughout the conference. And I thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Lynn Trimble. I'm the organizer of the meeting. Uh, we're going to kick off this morning's session with a number with a keynote speaker, and then we'll have our sessions following that in a similar format tomorrow. Uh, I want to thank our many sponsors for the meeting. Uh, first, our hosts, our co-hosts, actually, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, it's on the posters, yep, and, and Medicine, and of course, the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation. We are also uh, sponsored by a number of very generous supporters, NASA, Zymo Research, the U.S. Green Building Council, the Microbiome Journal, Biomed Central, so they're also on the poster you can see from behind me. Uh, we thank you all for coming and thank you for your interest. Uh, I hope there will be active discussion. Uh, please ask questions of the speakers. Uh, we are live cast as well, um, so this video will be available afterwards. And the photos you see me taking is Merlene, she's our photographer. I'll send you all a link after the conference, so if you want any photos, you're welcome to them. If you haven't stopped by the registration desk this morning, um, we have bags and bottles, um, some different things to give away for the meeting. I hope you enjoy those. And um, make your Moby if you haven't. Out there, there's microbes and little uh, keychain houses. They're from the conference. Please go ahead and have one of those. And I thank you, and I'm going to introduce Paul Zuski, our program director. Thank you. 
pain. Um, I can assure you, if you talk to some people who've been through that process, it is rigorous and painful, but we usually come to a better place. All right, so how did we get into the MOBI field? Well, the microbiology of the Built Environment Program emerged from Sloan's bioterrorism program. I, along with Ralph Gomery, developed and directed the bioterrorism program. We started it um, in 2000, and it, it was ended in, a, it was planned conclusion in 2010. So this is, it started long before the anthrax at, attacks and the 9-11 attacks. The goal of that program was to reduce the threat of bioterrorism. I could talk for, uh, that's another exciting program, I could talk for hours, but I won't. I just want to explain, frame the issue here. So as part of that program, we were trying to make buildings safer against biological threats. People spend 90% of their time indoors. How could we tweak the HVAC system so if there was something bad in the air, more of it ended up on the filters rather than in the air we breathe? And he, you know, again, here's a paper that ca came out of that work. But when, when doing this work, we realized that nobody really knew what was in normal air. Uh, sure, there were some people who studied mold and that said that was a problem. There were sick buildings, but nobody studied ordinary places where people live, work, and play. And we, we realized maybe this was really an important area, area, indoor microbial ecology. So I also want to give a little, another little plug for the Sloan Foundation's research program. We try to find areas that are interesting, important, where we can play an early and catalytic role and providing up to $50 million over 10 or 15 years can make a difference. So we have to be very focused. So what then I was calling indoor microbial ecology showed great promise. But if you want to start thinking about spending $50 million in a very focused way, and you, how do you, what, need, what do you need to think about? Well, one of the first things to consider is will prominent scientists get involved? And will they publish? Next thing to consider is will scientists, in this case many life scientists, engineers, architects, practitioners, other people collaborate? Will they? Will early career researchers invest their careers and get tenure by working in this new, perhaps risky field? Is the public actually interested in this new work? And will other funders support? So let's start with my first question. Will prominent scientists get involved early and publish? Established scientists can take risks. They're beyond the publish or perish area. They have tenure. So what if it takes a while to publish, uh, publish the work? Another benefit to working with prominent uh, established scientists early on in the career in the field, in establishing the field, is that others will pay attention to their work. I mean, we all have people that we look up to, and if they publish something, we say, wow, that might, that's interesting. So our first two uh, grantees were very prominent life scientists, and I think some people are going to be surprised by our first grantee. Our first grantee was Craig Venter. Uh, the grant was awarded in 2004. Craig at that time was and still is a prominent life scientist who could take a risk and will continue to take risks. In 2004, he was already famous for sequencing the human genome and identifying the microbes in the Sargasso Sea. And so when we spoke with him, we said, Craig, are you ready to move indoors? And he said, absolutely. He was ready to explore the indoors. So uh, he wrote a proposal, and the purpose of that proposal was to examine the environmental genomics of outdoor and indoor air in New York City. And it had a one-year term. Thinking back, that was extremely optimistic, considering that we really didn't know anything about exploring the indoor microbial world. So we'll fast forward. Um, it really was not so easy. I was thankful that the Venter Institute stayed with the project a grant awarded in 2004, the paper came out in 2013. 
So it shows that it was really, you take a top-notch team, and there are all sorts of challenges they identified. Sampling, contaminants, inhibitors. It was, it was uncharted territory, and they were flying into quicksand and swamps, if you think of traditional explorers. But they persevered, and they came up with the paper. But meanwhile, we, we always hedge our bets, and so we, we um, were able to attract another prominent life scientist, Norman Pace, and uh, he is famous for his work on the Tree of Life. His work has inspired many of the people who went into microbial ecology. And he was very famous for studying lots of out natural environments. We thought he might be interested in moving indoors because he published a paper on sh shower curtains. And the soap scum on your shower curtain actually isn't soap scum, it's microbial. So, Norm's first grant also was for exploration. We didn't have any hypotheses. We, this is all about funding exploration. So he was going to, going to begin to catalog the indoor microbial world. Now, fortunately, um, his work proceeded more quickly and um, was published in 2009. This is, there were very exciting and surprising results from his work on showerheads. Who even knew showerheads were going to be interesting? Who knew that drinking water would be interesting? In, in which we shower, we drink. Um, there's like lots of things that we just didn't know that were discovered by Norm. And we were happy to find out that the work indeed was publishable. Because remember, we're funding the Venter Institute and they're struggling. <clears throat> and so, and Norm's group had a number of challenges too. But anyway, fortunately this paper came out and it was the start of a long relationship with uh, the Pace Lab. So the next question I had was, will the life scientists collaborate with the engineers and the architects and the practitioners? Because we knew we needed people who already studied buildings to be in the program. And we started off with these prominent life scientists who thought, <laughs> thought of the building as a sampling site. Again, that's just how the program started. So we knew that these collaborations would not happen naturally. And these are why, I'll give you a few reasons why. Life scientists, engineers, and architects are trained differently, and they go to different meetings. I suspect most of the life scientists in this room would dream of having a paper in science or nature. The, engine, the environmental engineers really want to get into indoor air. And the architects, well, they design. Publications are not nearly as important to them as they are to the life scientists or engineers. And we knew that through, if we could help establish true collaborations, new and better ideas would emerge. So, we had already recruited the prominent life scientists. Now on to engineering. And I invited prominent environmental engineer Bill Nazaroff from UC Berkeley uh, to come into the program. He was a leader in environmental engineering, aerosol science, was the editor of that journal that all the environmental engineers studying indoor air quality want to be in indoor air. But again, he was reluctant. And often, the prominent scientists we go after early in the program, they don't need our money. They, they are doing just fine with what they're doing. But I was persistent. And Bill then teamed up with Jordan Peccia, who was at Yale. And these two engineers were fun. I went back to the grant files. It was really a fun walk down memory lane. And the purpose of their grant for two environmental engineers was to explore the microbial ecology of the built environment. So they were going to bring in engineering techniques and thinking and aerosol science. And their first discovery, and again, I'm not talking about this really, talk about, was that people emit 37 million microbial equivalents per hour. And this was published in Indoor Air. They later determined that uh, resuspension was important. But this was like really a, a very important finding. Like, who knew? And you're going to hear later from Jordan in the meeting. All right, so now, but we also needed architects. These are the people that designed the building. Someone designed this beautiful space we're in. It, 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 and it wasn't designed as a sampling site for life scientists or a problem for HVAC engineers. 
Uh, Jessica Green approached me uh, about, she was very interested um, in this whole area. And when she first approached me, I knew the Pace Lab and the Venture Group were struggling. But she, she was very persistent and because she brought to me a vision of linking biology and architecture. So she brought in prominent architect Charlie Brown, who was an internationally re recognized educator, author, and researcher on sustainability and engineering, and, and excuse me, and energy, certainly not engineering. And together with Sloan support, they created the Biology and the Built Environment Center at the University of Oregon. Now their first big discovery was that architectural design influences the diversity and structure of the built environment microbiome. These architects, while they were designing the beautiful spaces, were actually structuring the uh, built environment microbiome. Architecture has an impact. And you're going to hear from Jessica and some architects later in the meeting. <coughs> the program also needed building scientists, people who really study buildings. And microbial ecologist Jack Gilbert had a really big idea. He came to me and he said, oh, Paula, we've got to study the do the hospital microbiome project. I said, wow, that's a pretty big project. And um, we decided he, he did need some, someone who really knew about buildings. And he brought in a prominent building scientist, Jeff Siegel, who's on the faculty at the University of Toronto, so that the building science questions would be incorporated into the experimental design. And really thinking about air exchange rates, temperature, humidity, occupancy. And there were really lots of very exciting findings about the hospital microbiome. And since the people, the scientists and engineers will talk about that later, all I can tell you is sterility is not guaranteed. And Jeff and Jack will speak later in the meeting. <coughs> So while these three collaborations were good, I mean, bringing in the engineers, the architects, the building science, we knew that we needed to really build a multidisciplinary community. And so we were fortunate to call on two di different people to work on very different projects. Um, Jonathan Eisen, who's an evolutionary biologist at UC Davis, and Mark Hernandez, an environmental engineer at the University of Colorado at Boulder. So Jonathan established and directs the microbiology of the built environment network. It's a website and a series of associated activities that can take place online and in person to create a network of people who are interested in the microbiology of the built environment. Their blog posts, their news stories, their, there's all sorts of things there. And again, here's a screenshot from last week. And Jonathan's going to give you the real details behind this work. Uh, Mark Hernandez, in collaboration with Alina Handorian, who's shown here on the right in the photo, helped create community by organizing uh, annual microbiology of the built environment meetings in Boulder. Mark and Alina ran five really productive meetings. And up front, they engaged a social scientist to help them to come up with ways to create community. One of the methods they used was that when they invited the labs, they invited labs, the PI, the postdoc, and the students. So you had people at all different career stages. All of the lunches and dinners had assigned seating. And they were mixed by discipline, career stage, gender. And this proved to be really important because those, uh, there were very interesting discussions that led to many interesting and important collaborations. Mark and Alina could not be at the conference uh, because they're teaching today. All right, so my third question is, will early career researchers invest their careers in this and get tenure? Now, the senior people are great. I gave you all the reasons why we like to start things with the senior people. But it's the early career people who become the lifeblood of a program. They really go after new ideas. They publish quickly and often. And they have to. They need, they're on the tenure clock. They will travel near and far to give talks on their meetings. They're not burned out by travel. They want to go to all those places. They want people to listen to their work. 
they will become the future leaders of an emerging field. So they're very, very important. And our question, though, is would these publications <coughs> help them get tenure? Would this be viewed as valuable by the, whatever the established tenure committees were in their departments? So I went back and I went into the grant files. And I, I actually was surprised because when I looked at the career stage, of the people for their first grant, in this case, Jessica Green, Jordan Peccia, and Jack Gilbert. All three of them were assistant professors. And I'm truly, I and the program is truly fortunate that they um, did, you know, did great work, continue to do great work, are all tenured professors, are leaders in the field. All of them, I had no influence over who was on the National Academies. Uh, microbiome of the Built Environment Committee. They were all appointed to the committee. And the other thing that they're doing, and again, lots of people in the, in the air field are doing these things. So as I said, I could only highlight a few. But they're also ch training the future, so additional early career uh, leaders. And I have uh, three people here. Uh, Brent Stevens. Brent was an assistant professor when he was called in by Jack. Gilbert and Jeff Siegel to work on the hospital microbiome project. He's now a tenured associate professor at Illinois Institute of Technology. Erica Hartman was a postdoc at the BioBE Center at Oregon. She's now an assistant professor at Northwestern. And Karen Dana Miller was both a graduate student and a postdoc with Jordan Peccia at Yale. And now she's an assistant professor at Ohio State. You're going to hear later from Erica and Karen, Brent is teaching. All right, so now let's move on. Is the field interesting to the public? Why do we care? Because our tax dollars fund a lot of work, and we hope that our tax dollars will be used to fund programs that we spin off. So what was great, one of the early successes of the Grant to the Venture Institute is that there was an immediate story in the New York Times after mapping the human genome, analyzing the city's air. And as a New Yorker, of course our air should be analyzed first. Anyway, and you know this, that story, it took quite a long time to get that information. But if you look over the course of the program, the work has been featured in, you know, this my favorite hometown paper, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Science Friday, Associated Press, the Wall Street Journal, lots and lots of stories. Our first plenary speaker was a journalist, so I think there's a lot of interest. So now we get to the final question, will other funders support? Why is this important to us? Well, as I said earlier, we have very limited funds, so we need others to step in. So our goal is to, <laughs> be early and catalytic and show that the work is important. So we started off by leveraging other studies. Both Jill Banfield, a professor at UC Berkeley, and Susan Lynch, our plenary speaker, professor at UCSF, had NIH grants. Jill was studying neo premature infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. Sue was studying the role of microbiome and asthma. And Sloan Funding leveraged these grants by funding building scientists and additional microbial measurements. And you'll hear from Sue shortly. I'm really excited about her work. I'm also excited about the work from the Banfield Lab. Jill is teaching, but her work will be presented by the newly minted PhD, Dr. Bubba Brooks. And so um, other things that we did to attract uh, funders, we worked with NASA to support uh, postdocs, and I'm proud to say three of them are here today. The grantees, if you want to be a tenured professor in academia, you have to know how to raise money for your, grant, for your program. So I know from talking to the grantees, they have already gotten grants for the microbiology, the built environment type experiments from NSF, EPA, the Department of Justice, Housing and Urban Development, and NASA, and there may be more, but those are the ones I know. And we also, to engage future funders, have this fabulous report, um, Microbiomes of the Built Environment, a Research Agenda for Indoor Microbiology, Human Health, and Buildings. 
So if I look at my, I can check off all of the questions. The answer was yes to the prominent scientist, yes to the collaboration, yes to early career researchers, yes to the public finding it interesting, and yes that other funders would support. So in summary, the Sloan Foundation has provided over 150 grants and $50 million in support. There have been over 300 peer-reviewed publications with over 16,000 citations. As you can see from this meeting, there is a very vibrant, multidisciplinary community. And just as the bioterrorism program led to the microbiology of the built environment program, the microbiology of the built environment program, once you start studying microbial function, has now led to a new program called the chemistry of indoor environments. So at that note, I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Jessica. <laughs> so I'm just um, curious about how, you know, you kind of outlined how you quantify the impact of your, um, this particular program, but I would imagine that um, quantifying impact also relies on letting time pass. So how long on average at the Sloan Foundation um, does it take to really see the full impact of any of the uh, programs that are sponsored? That's a good question, Jessica, and it's a difficult one to answer. Uh, you know, right now, you know, I can say we have people, papers, and citations, right? So that's, that's a good place to be when you're funding a basic research program. We also have a research agenda that I hope other funders will take up. But, you know, Ed Young doesn't think we'll ever know what is a healthy human microbiome. You know, it would be good to know what was a desirable indoor microbiome, or maybe, it would, maybe what at least would be an undesirable microbiome. The Sloan Foundation does not fund work on health, so there are a lot of uh, potential health implications to this work, but again, all of that work needs to be followed up. So I, you know, I think that, you know, certain things will happen in a few years and other things will take 10 years. Well, thank you.